Well, welcome, everybody, to another edition of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck. And, of course, that means some smart talk radio is in your future. This segment ought to be a good one. Now we're going to be talking to Elliot Eisenberg, Ph.D. He's a nationally acclaimed economist and public speaker specializing in making the arcane and minutiae of economics fun, relevant, and educational. I can speak to that firsthand. He earned his B.A. in economics and first-class honors from McGill University in Montreal, as well as a master's and Ph.D. in public administration from Syracuse. He's also the creator of the Multifamily Stock Index, uh, and much, much more. He's author of, of more than 85 articles. He's a regular blogger, uh, as well as a consultant to several large real estate professional associations. Long history in the financial and real estate world. Uh, Elliot, how are you, my friend? I am terrific. Thank you for asking. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Do, do peop- you. Well, do people refer to you as doctor? Do I need to refer to you as Dr. Eisenberg? If you wish, you may, but you may also call me Elliot. Please do. All right. Well, let's do this. I know uh, you spend a lot of your time traveling around the country. You're talking about real estate, but maybe even on a larger level, just the economy in general. And I'm very interested just to get your take uh, from whichever perspective you'd like to give it. where are we uh, in early 2016? Where great our economy right now, uh, A to F? All right, look, the economy's okay. There's nothing shiningly spectacular about the economy. I think that's the, 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 the most important thing to keep in mind. A lot of people think, oh, uh, 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 it, it's, it's going to get much better. No, I don't think it's going to get much better. Uh, energy prices are going to stay low, which hurts the oil patch. Uh, manufacturing is a little bit weak because of the strong dollar and also in part because of the oil patch and corporate investment and equipment isn't so great. But everything else is fine. And that gets us about 90% of our economy. The service sector is doing well. 85% the construction sector is doing fine, be it residential or non-residential or industrial. So we're okay. And as long as we keep creating let's say 160, 170, 180,000 jobs a month, we will avoid a recession, and 216 will look very similar to 2015. So this panic about, oh, you know, China and Europe and Japan and Brazil and Russia, either all in recession or slowing in the case of China, is overblown and I think very misplaced. We're a big enough economy. We can withstand some bad news. We've gone through a lot of bad news in the last six or seven years, and this doesn't look any worse than any earlier weakness patch that we've overcome. Well, that was kind of my, going to be my next question, and that is uh, you can't help but hear and kind of feel at some level that we are more than ever tied to sort of a world economic system and tied to the world. And what you're saying is uh, calm down a little bit. We're strong uh, on our own, and China, while may, may be a little bit of a pain in the rear, really is not enough to really do the kind of damage people are talking about. That's generally right. I mean, if China were to really unravel badly, that could certainly have some very negative repercussions, and maybe it could throw us into a recession indirectly. It wouldn't be our exports to China. They're too small to matter. But it would be, it would hurt Europe. It would really crush industrial prices for agricultural commodities and industrial commodities, you know, oil and, and copper and nickel and all those things. And that would have tertiary effects on our economy. But outside of that, if China just continues to slow like it has over the last five or six years, for the next five or ten years, we'll be okay. Again, we're not big enough. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we could pull the economy out of a recession or drive them in because of our behavior. We're not big enough anymore. China's too big and Europe's too big and other countries and Brazil and so on. But we can certainly keep a, a recession at bay with a healthy economy, and our, our economy is healthy enough. Labor growth has been good. Wage growth is finally starting to take place now. After a really prolonged period of very meager growth, last six or eight months things are better, and just last month inflation began to take off a little bit, which is very good news because we've had such low levels, almost no inflation at all. These are all pretty positive signs. What about, uh, we we can't have this discussion, of course, without talking about our friends at the Fed. And what about, uh, they've raised interest rates, 25 basis points. Uh, What do you see for the balance of the year, and what is the reasoning? And if you see them doing it, do you agree with that? Okay, 
a lot of questions there. So the Fed's going to raise rates. It's almost inconceivable the Fed will go this year without raising rates. Unemployment rates are 4.9%, and at that low level, and they'll continue to fall as the year goes through, so we could have by the end of the year 4.5. It's impossible to have full, I mean, really full employment, 4.5% full employment, and have a Fed funds rate of 25 basis points. What's going to, I think, really determine this is GDP growth on one hand, obviously, labor force growth, as I mentioned, and critically, inflation rates. If we continue to see very anemic inflation rates like we've seen until last month, really low inflation rates last couple of months, they'll have a very hard time raising rates. They may raise them once. But if inflation that we saw last month continues over the course of the year and we end up seeing close to 2% inflation year over year, the Fed's going to raise several times because if they don't, the bond vigilantes, if you will, will will start raising rates for them, and the Fed doesn't want to cede that control to the market. So I still expect a rate rise in June, probably one in September, certainly one in December. So I'm thinking two rate rises over the course of the year, and maybe three, certainly not one before June. That's not going to happen. Elliot, are you, uh, when you say you think you could project maybe two rate rises, some people might think that's aggressive. Uh, do, are you, do you think, in agreement with most economists, or, or is your view unique? I don't think it's that unique. No, I think I'm pretty middle of the road ish. The market, however, you, know, you look at Wall Street. They don't see this many rate increases. If you talk to economists, they do. So, there's, and there's been this disconnect for a while. So maybe I've been, I'm being a little bit too aggressive. Last year, I thought they, the economy would have done better. Inflation might have occurred earlier and so on and so forth. I thought they would raise in September. They held off for arguably good reasons. So maybe I'm a little optimistic. What How about? That sound? Yeah, no, 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 that's good. You you also have a long background uh, working with real estate professionals, real estate associations, in the housing market. I'm curious, uh, kind of taking a little bit different path on this discussion now is: Do you see uh, the new first time home buyers, the younger buyers, millennials, if you want to call them that? Uh, what are their house purchasing habits, and is that changing the real estate industry in any way, shape, or form? Millennials, we don't know. It's interestingly enough, we still don't know much about these kids. They're now aged about 20 to 35, roughly. That's the ballpark. What's critical about them is they are now beginning to enter key home buying ages. 31, 32 is the peak of home buying. So they're just the oldest ones now are just beyond that. But you've got 60 million of them coming up in the future, or 50 million more coming up between ages 20 and 34, 31, 32. So there's, we don't know a lot about them, but we know they're going to get married, they're going to have kids, they're going to want a place to live. The big question I think that builders and developers and realtors have to think about is what kind of lifestyle do these kids want to lead? Many of them have grown up on, of course, smartphones and Uber apps, and they don't need to have a car. They want to live downtown. They don't want to own. They've seen their parents lose money owning a home. They want to be more flexible in their living arrangements. They want to live in cool parts of town, and so on and so forth. So at the end, it wouldn't surprise me if most live lives similar to their parents, but that some of them, a few percentage more than in earlier generations, elect to live downtown the whole time, not have kids, not get married, or have fewer kids or get married later. They have student debt, of course, too. But they'll live a little bit differently. They want, they want to be connected, and they want nice spaces. Uh, they can be smaller spaces, but they want them with lots of technology in them and lots of conveniences. So it's a little different viewpoint, no question. Uh, again, if you just joined us, you're truly Warner Lewis from the Flight Tech of Lewis at Large Radio. You hear us here every week, and we're talking to Elliot Eisenberg. He is a nationally acclaimed economist and public speaker, uh, makes uh, makes some pretty darn good observations uh, in a m- little bit more lighthearted way about the e- economics in general and the economy. He earned a B.A. from McGill as well as a master's and Ph.D. from Syracuse, uh, has been an advisor to numerous real estate and mortgage uh, industry professionals across the country and continues to speak on all kinds of economic issues. Elliot, uh, we're staring at an election uh, in the face here in just a, in just a few months, and I'm curious again, without becoming political, I would like to hear your take. Uh, tell us what the how the economy might react or benefit or not from a Trump presidency, from a Cruz presidency 
and from a Clinton presidency and from a Sanders. And you don't have to take a long time, but just again, stay non political and just tell us as yeah. you see it as from an econ- economic from an economist point of view. I think from the economic standpoint, uh, Clinton presidency is the easiest by far to handicap or predict. Uh, she's going to follow pretty conventional policies. She's not going to do anything particularly out there, if you will. She's going to be a little bit to the left than maybe Obama, but I don't think much to speak of. Her tax and immigration and labor policies are all going to be understood and knowable within limits. There won't be any big surprises. Markets don't like surprises. The other three are all a real crapshoot economically. I think if one of those candidates really becomes the prohibitive favor to win the general, not necessarily a prime, not necessarily a nomination, but the general, I think markets would get nervous because we don't know what Sanders or Cruz or Trump will do in terms of most of these policies. They're, you know, Sanders is a, is a longtime politician, but not in the national spotlight. He's further ahead than either Cruz or Trump, certainly, on just developing a real solid platform. But none of these guys have really had much power for much length of time. So they're going to make a lot of mistakes, and they're going to do things that are that I think if what they say they want to do is going to be quite uh, not just necessarily destructive, although possibly, but certainly disruptive. Sanders, if he tries to get single payer passed, will cause a lot of, of upset in healthcare markets across the board for medical devices and in prescription drugs and hospitals and doctors and so on. Uh, Bernie Sanders is you know uh, 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 Trump is a real uh, tabula rasa. We don't know what he's going to do, and that's even more stressful for markets. So I think the long and the short of it is there's a a likelihood that markets will be distressed. Corporate investment will probably fall a little bit until things become more clear, and the eventual winner is more likely to be known. And this is not a push for or against, but could you make the case at least Donald Trump has been in private business so Wall Street might feel a little bit more comfortable, or is that a naive view? There's certainly something to that. There's no question. But government and po- government and business are very, very different. In business, a CEO says do something, and the subordinates generally do it. In politics, the politician says do something, uh, especially uh, uh, a president, an executive as opposed to a legislator. And you do something, and the bureaucracy says thank you, but we'll wait you out, and in two or three years you'll be gone. Getting things done is very hard in Washington. Our Constitution is designed to stymie the actions of a chief executive and the legislature, for that matter. The experience is not unhelpful, but I don't think it's nearly as helpful as we think. You know, that's, why, that's why we find that senators tend to be poorer presidents than governors, because these governors understand how to, how to be a chief executive of a large, complex bureaucracy. Right. You know, as an economist, I'm, I'm also curious. Uh, you saw what happened in 2007, 2008, and nine the, the entire the housing crisis and all of that. What, uh, from where you sit right now, uh, we are a few years out from that. And I'm curious, do you feel, is it possible, A, that that could happen? Well, certainly it's possible it could happen again. But is there any reason to fear that there's another bubble percolating somewhere else? possibly in a different part of the economy that should have us being concerned? Um, the answer is unlikely. I don't really think so. I, I think the areas we see a bubble clearly are in student debt, which is uh, approaching $1.3 trillion. It's now the second largest form of debt on the household balance sheet outside of home mortgages, which are quite a lot larger, but still bigger than credit cards or auto loans and so on. And if you can't discharge them in bankruptcy, this is a big number. It's delaying household formation, buying cars and getting married and so on. It's a problem. And there may be, because interest rates are so low, asset price bubbles floating around in commercial real estate, maybe gold prices are a little high and so on and so forth. But none of these rise to the level of the housing problems of 2006, 7, 8, 9. And importantly, banks are much better uh, capitalized than they were back then. So they can withstand a lot more shocks to their balance sheet. So, for example, the oil patch is doing very poorly. There'll be a number of bankruptcies. There have already been a number, but there'll be many more if prices stay low for much longer. And banks are setting aside already you know, half a billion here, half a billion, another bank, 200 million here. 
it's not going to matter much to bank profitability or bank lending activity. So, yes, it's possible, it's unlikely, and we're in much better economic shape than we were back then to withstand the, 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 the thrust of it. You know, you brought up uh, depressed oil prices. Let's uh, talk about that from, again, from an economist's point of view. You have, I know, certainly people are noticing lower prices at the pump. Uh, and I'm just curious, as is the net consumer gain there, uh, where is that playing itself out negatively, though, in the oil business? And how is that? how are those balancing themselves out within the general economy? That's a great question. And I think we economists as a whole have done a disservice to the country. The consensus was a year or two ago that, you know, in late 14, middle of 14, oil prices began to decline. We've now had a year and a half of it. The expectation was this would be an unambiguous good, and it would be great from the get-go. But what happened, however, was the decline was extremely severe. Had it fallen from $110 a barrel to, say, $60 a barrel, it would have been wonderful. There would have been almost no negative consequences, except in foreign oil-producing countries like Canada, maybe, but Nigeria, Angola, Venezuela, and so on. But because oil prices fell so much so quickly, the negative impacts became very clear very quickly. Firms pulling back on exploration and production, rigs going out of operation, Halliburton, Schlumberger, and the oil service industries, companies laying off hundreds of thousands of workers around the globe, and about 150,000 collective workers in the U.S. And these negatives hit the, hit the, the, hit the economy very fast. While the benefits of saving $1,000 a year in oil prices and filling your car up at the pump come in only slowly and monthly or fill up by fill up. So we had the negative consequences are now largely through our economy. I think by the end of 16, we will have felt almost all the negative ramifications. And starting in the middle of 16, end of 16, certainly by 17, we begin to really get the benefits of increased savings and increased spending, household behaviors, improving households, believing this low oil price situation will sustain itself for a prolonged period of time, and we'll get the benefit. But as of yet, we really haven't gotten the benefit. We've gotten all the negatives without much benefit. Let's also, we can't have this discussion without at least touching a little bit on the housing market. Let's talk a little bit about right. uh, the health of the construction, the, 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 the consumer construction business, so to speak, uh, single-family right. residences, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you see that? Is it, is it moving forward? Is it stuck in neutral? Tell us about that. Well, it's interesting you ask. Uh, single fam starts last year were in the low 700, 715, 720,000. It wouldn't surprise me if they hit 800,000 this year, a bump up of 10% activity. That would be nice. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't happen. Uh, how, job, you know, creates new job, new jobs. Uh, their monthly job creation is good at 160, 170,000 a month. We'll create 2 million jobs. We'll need, you know, a bunch, a lot more housing. So we'll get, say, 800,000 from the single fam side. Last year, multifam was a shade under 400. Maybe it hits 430, 440, so a 10% rise there. And uh, that gets us to 1.2 million. That's still very substandard. Uh, we should be at 1.5, but we can't get there because credit availability is hard. Income growth has been weak. Of late, generally speaking, it's improving very recently, but last four or five years, student debt's a bit of a problem and so on. Credit availability is hard. So it's still an industry that's recovering. I guess the best way to think about it is to say the following. Look, normally in a normal recovery, housing is one of the key drivers getting us out of the recession. It grows fast and it contributes mightily to the increase in GDP. But because this housing improvement has been so lackluster, it still has more to go. So this year it could contribute two or three-tenths of a percent to GDP, which otherwise would not have been the case because it always would have been done. You know, back in 9, back in 10, 11, 12, it would have risen to its maximal point. Now we're still meandering there slowly. So this is giving us a little bit of insurance. It's a good thing. We would have preferred to happen earlier, but given that it didn't now, It'll continue to improve. Overall, 10%. And on the existing side, I would expect to see a 4 to 5% increase in sales activity at most. And the biggest reason it's not better is because there's no inventory of existing homes. Houses aren't up for sale. There's a chronic lack of inventory across the board all over the country.
All right. Well, Elliot, as we start again, we're talking to Elliot Eisenberg, uh, one of America's uh, most acclaimed economists and public speakers, talking about everything from the economy to housing, uh, has certainly worked with all kinds of mortgage and real estate uh, uh, groups uh, historically, also with the National Association of Home Builders. But uh, as we kind of wind down here, Elliot, uh, let's do sort of good news, bad news, and let's end on some good news. Uh, from your position, again, as an economist, uh, Tell our Lewis at Large listeners one thing we should be very concerned about, possibly, with the economy going forward. And then, on the other hand, as we end up, what some things we should feel really good about? The, big, the concern out there is certainly the globe. The rest, of the, the rest of the planet. The rest of the planet's weak. And it's not impossible to imagine that if the globe went into a synchronized decline, you know, a, a, and it all unraveled together. So China goes down, and Europe starts to have real problems, uh, and the emerging market starts to default on all their dollar-denominated debts because their currencies are bad, because oil prices are low. This would be a real problem for us, and we could not single-handedly overcome it. it. We just couldn't. We don't have enough firepower domestically to do it. So that's the big fear. That's the downside risk. But that having been said, the likelihood of a recession in 2016 is no more than 25%. Under the best of conditions, it's 15%. And we've been creating jobs at a staggeringly solid rate for a very long time. And then the, the, the flip side of that is almost nobody is getting fired. The weekly number of employment claims in this country is literally at the same level it was in numbers as it was 40 years ago in the early 70s when Richard Nixon was president and the population of this country was 100 million less. So our labor markets are still very strong and very good, and that's critical, absolutely critical. Well, that's some good news, and appreciate it. Elliot Eisenberg, uh, National Economist. Elliot, a uh, lot of good information from you comes uh, on a very regular basis. Share with our Lewis at Large listeners how they can learn more about you and uh, get a hold of some of the material you create. Thank you. Yes, delighted to. So I put out every day 70 words on economics. No graphs, no ads, no charts, no links, and no photos. To get it, all you've got to do is go to my website, www.econ, E-C-O-N, 70, for 70 words, and there you can sign up, or you can text the word bow tie. I always wear bow ties, B-O-W-T-I-E, no hyphen, no space, to the number 22828. And I also sell a syndicated article, brief 550-word article, every month on economics. And you can go to my website, again, econ70.com, to learn more. Well, again, I appreciate very much your insights and your time. And uh, uh, if you've got a minute and you can slow down, we'd love to have you back on the show again sometime. Consider it done. Your, 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 your wish is my command. Sounds good. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. It's time for another edition of Lewis at Large. 60 minutes of Smart Talk Radio featuring guests from all walks of life in conversation with your host, Warner Lewis. So sit back and lend us your ears for the next hour. Now here with today's first guest is the host of Lewis at Large, Warner Lewis. Well, welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis for the flight deck. And of course, as always, that means smart. Talk radio is in your future and very happy to have back with us uh, again uh, for this segment. A guy, Tim English, he is a recognized authority on the topic of musical plagiarism in pop music. He's also appeared on hundreds of radio shows, including this one a couple of years ago. He's the winner of Independent Publishers Bronze Medal for one of the best books of the year. He's also the author of Popology, the music of the era in the lives of four icons of the 1960s, which we talked to him about a couple of years ago. Brand new work called Sounds Like Teen Spirit, Stolen Melodies, Ripped Off Riffs, and the Secret History of Rock and Roll. That is a quite a piece of subject matter to talk about. Tim, uh, how are you, my friend? I'm great. Great to be with you again, Warner. Well, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's remind everybody, again, a little bit about your background, besides being a popologist. I, I love that term. Uh, <laughs> wow, it's uh, meaningful or meaningless. Uh, tell our Lewis at Large listeners a little bit about your background. Well, I, uh, I did a, uh, the first edition of this book came out about 10 years ago, um, and it was fairly successful. 
for uh, got a lot of attention and uh, a lot of the, probably thousands of radio interviews to back it up. It's just a great uh, topic of discussion, I think, for everybody. And um, they, uh, the reason I did the book was on songs that sounded like other songs was because nobody else had ever done it before. And uh, then uh, uh, subsequently to that, I did another book, uh, which you mentioned earlier, called Popology. It uh, examined the music and the lives of some of the great icons of the 1960s. And uh, this edition of Sounds Like Teen Spirit, which just came out about a month ago, is expanded to about triple the length of the original. It includes uh, a lot of updates and also includes many case, many additional cases, including ones that just popped up in the last 10 years, um, which we never seem to have a shortage of these cases, as you as you know. I got a question for you. The whole idea of, as they say, is there really a new idea in rock? Um, and I, it just include all music, I would assume, but... Um, this work does a lot of interesting comparisons of what one song sounds like another. There's also some references to legal cases, rock music and stolen melodies and accusations of such landing in a courtroom. That's not new, is it? No, it's been going on for a long time. And, uh, the case that sort of got me interested in it was way back when I was a kid. I remember the My Sweet Lord, yeah. He's So Fine piece, uh, George Harrison, uh, shortly after the Beatles broke up, had a massive number one hit all over the world with My Sweet Lord. And the DJs here in this country began playing it back to back with yeah. uh, with He's So Fine. And uh, that turned into a legal case. Uh, as you know, though, from the book, I mean, I do get into some of the legal things and explain what's involved in proving one of these cases, but... Um, you know, I also have, as you mentioned, a lot of cases are just sort of oddball coincidence, uh, homages, uh, inf- one thing that influenced each other, in- another, um, you know, it goes all the way back to the first song of the rock and roll era of uh, Bill Haley and the Comets, Rock Around the Clock. Um, the myth, the uh, verse of that song is directly lifted from Hank Williams' song, uh, Move It On Over, which came out a few years prior to that. Uh, I also examined, I didn't even know this for a long time, uh, Johnny Cash's uh, false in prison woos. That was, he got in a lawsuit over that one for lifting it uh, from a song by uh, Gordon Jenkins. So there's a long history of this, and it's ongoing to this day. I've got, I mean, again, I've I've looked through the book. It's it's fascinating. We're going to talk about a couple of these that that sound alike, so to speak, and that are from family. But here's one, if you know Jimi Hendrix at all, on his first album, Third Stone from the Sun, that riff, that musical riff right there, sounds, it is identical to the riff, the primary riff in Swing Town by Steve Miller. Identical. You could play them back yeah. to back and you'd go, wow, they may be slightly different paced, but the note patterns are exactly the same. So at what point, and I know you're not an attorney, but at what point does someone say, nope, that's my song or that's my riff? At what point is a riff just happen to be some notes coincidentally thrown together? Because there's a bunch of them that sound the same. Well, first of all, it will come as no surprise to your, your listeners to know that the more successful a song is, the right. more likely it is right. to uh, to attract a lawsuit. Right. Uh, if there's no pot of gold to be made by the lawyers or the publishers, uh, they will go after that. Um, such was the case with My Sweet Lord, such was the case with Word Lines. There are quite a few other cases in the book where there wasn't any legal action over it, uh, probably, or uh, I would I would, uh, I would, guess because the song just didn't generate any money. <laughs> and to, you know, it's got to, to get the lawyers involved. These are very high-priced business attorneys. To get them involved, you really got to have a pretty good shot at recovering some substantial uh, compensation on it. Uh, to prove a plagiarism case, though, as I explained in the book, you got to prove, number one, that the person could have heard the song they're accused of stealing for this reason uh, a lot of artists will put up a wall around them where they say well we don't listen to any unsolicited unsolicited material that's why somebody uh sends in you know there's a hit song and somebody says i said that's my song i sent you a copy of it you ripped it off they say i'm oh, sorry sir we have a policy we don't listen to anything goodbye go home see you later you know uh but the, you'll notice in a lot of these cases um this was the case with sam smith and his song stay with me when he was accused of uh, stealing the melody from Tom Petty's I Won't Back Down, uh, the first thing they usually say is, I never heard that song. <laughs> from a legal standpoint, it doesn't matter whether you heard it or not. The only thing is, could you have heard it? And in the case of that, I mean, Tom Petty's 
song, especially in this country, has been played, still played all the time on the radio, even though it's uh, really almost 30 years old at this point. Um, so once you prove the access, then you also have to prove uh, it's a two-part test, and it's called substantial similarity. And with that, you'll with that sort of vague term, you'll understand why many of these cases get settled before they ever get to court. That was the case with uh, Sam Smith and Tom Petty. It was an out of court settlement that was later leaked. Uh, for in the case of Pharrell and Robin Thicke with board lines, they went to court. The case got in front of a jury, and remember, you're in front of a jury of non musicians, people right. who don't really understand the technical aspects of music. And they lost that case, uh, you know, and the, it's under appeal, but the award in that was over $7 million. So um, a lot of times we'll see they're settled before they get to the jury because it is sort of a vague definition. What you think is similar, substantially similar, I may not. What about this whole, and again, if you just join us, we're talking to Tim English, a popologist. Uh, uh, I know you a lot more than that. He's he's written a, a couple of fascinating books uh, on popular music, the most recent of which is called Sounds Like Teen Spirit, Stolen Melodies, Ripped Off Riffs, and the Secret History of Rock and Roll, talking about songs that sound alike, songs that are themed alike, songs that are taken rock to rock, some from classical music to rock, uh, interesting comparisons indeed. Here's here's one uh, right here. What about the entire issue of covers? And again, I would assume if you pay certain ASCAP, American Society of Composers and Publishers, fees, you're allowed to re-record certain songs. Or share with our audience, if you could, to the extent that you know, when bands perform cover versions of another band's song, particularly live, like at a concert, uh, and there's several of them that do all the time, are they paying rights fees, or are those covered already by the licensing they've already paid for? I'm, I'm not clear on whether it's in a concert, whether you have to pay it. I mean, radio fees, you'd be familiar with those. I mean, uh, you do have to pay fees on that, on playing it, because right. you're charging uh, charging to, to uh, people admission, or you're charging advertisers, you're making money off of it. Uh, I'm not exactly clear on the concert itself, but if you just do a cover version, you have to pay it. Obviously, if you cover it and put it out and are making money off it, you do have to uh, compensate uh, the uh, writer of the original song. Well, here's an example of one that we're kind of talking about, how songs influence another one. Uh, share with us, you've got a piece in here about, and I'm trying to find some songs that I think most people will at least have heard of, the Love and Spoonfuls version of Daydream, uh, What a Day for a Daydream, and then McCartney talking about Good Day Sunshine. That do, they yeah, don't sound HB. alike, but thematically they're alike. I think that's an example, I think I say in the book, of a song that was influenced by another, but it's not really melodically similar. He got kind of got down the feel, and the, the lyrical content is similar. I, I, I think it pointed out as a way to be influenced by a song without, you know, blatantly ripping it off. Paul McCartney comes up with his own melody, but sort of the... Uh, the lyrical content of it and the uh, sort of the feel of the two songs are very similar. And uh, and Daydream was a hit very early, I think, in January '66 in England, just a month or two before they uh, recorded "Good Day Sunshine" for the uh, Revolver album. You know, another band that is sort of famous for you can say ripping off, you can say embellishing, you can say honoring, whatever you want. Led Zeppelin, uh, and you've got a, quite a piece in here about them. <laughs> You listen to any Led Zeppelin album, you go, gosh, I've heard those lyrics before somewhere else uh, yeah. in a different deal. Why Why do you think that is as a band that was as talented uh, in so many fronts as that one was? Uh, why would they bother? Because their original stuff is so good in and of itself. I know, and I really would have to say that Zeppelin, I mean, I, I try to shy away from the term plagiarism because I think when we, we hear the term plagiarism, we sort of uh, it carries a uh, you know a meaning that uh, people think it means that this was done deliberately and consciously and I think a lot of these cases it was unconscious um, from a legal standpoint it doesn't matter whether it was conscious or unconscious if you violated someone's copyright uh, you're liable for it Zeppelin's weird though I mean because they 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 were really blatantly I think failed to credit people in a number of instances. Uh, one of which was Willie Dixon with the song "A uh, Whole Lot of Love," big Zeppelin song, obviously been heard for many years and played for many years. And um, but the the lyrics and the music of that were very 
close to uh, a song Lily Dixon wrote that Muddy Waters recorded and later the Small Faces uh, in England, uh, You Need Love. And they asked Jimmy Page about it years later, and he said, well, Robert Plant was supposed to change the lyrics around, and he didn't do it. <laughs> so that was kind of a giveaway. Uh, Willie Dixon's daughter heard the Zeppelin song, Oh, I Love, sometime in the 80s, and said, why are they doing your song? And they brought uh, legal action, so he's co-credited and has been now for about 30 years on the whole lot of love. Weird thing is, on the first album, they, they did credit Dixon on two of the songs. Um, you Shook Me was one of them. Um, but then they failed to credit him on the second album, on a couple, on not only that, but uh, Bring It On on the Whole Lot of Love, but Bring It On Home. More, more kind of blatant than that, though, was what they did with uh, the song Dazed and Confused, uh, there was a, a singer-songwriter named Jake Holmes that had recorded the song in 1967 and released it. And uh, he, he actually shared a, a bill with Page of the Yardbirds a couple of times in Greenwich Village. And um, the song found its way into the Yardbirds set. Uh, you can watch it. There's a version of it on YouTube uh, from 1968. It's sort of in between the Holmes version and the Zeppelin version. Uh, when Zeppelin finally released it on their second album in 1969, though, they didn't credit Jake Holmes at all. <laughs> and if you listen to the songs, and everybody can listen to all these on YouTube now, which is great. You can just compare them for yourself. Uh, the melody and the uh, instrumentation and the lyrics are very close to Jake Holmes. I couldn't figure out why that one had never seen any legal action, but finally it did just about five years ago. And I, I think with a lot of these people, they just want some recognition, you know, like Jake Holmes said, obviously they took the song to a whole other place. You could say they did that with a whole lot of love, too, from the Dixon song. But, um, you know, they should give some sort of credit to the original writer. And now if you buy a Zeppelin DVD that contains uh, these and confuse, it'll say, the credits the members of Zeppelin, it says, Inspiration by Jake Holmes. Wow, what a tip of the hat. That's uh, interesting. Again, yeah. we're talking about the book, T Sounds Like Teen Spirit. It's all about stolen melodies, ripped off riffs, and the secret history of rock and roll by Tim English, uh, who's written a couple of books on, uh, on rock and on popular music, and he's been on this show before. Happy to have him back. Uh, Tim, here's one. What about, uh, again, and let's just, we'll limit this one to the world of rock and popular music for right now. There are those artists, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll throw Zeppelin in there with them, that, that very consciously, knowingly, yep, I like that riff, I like that set of lyrics, we're going to use them uh, because, we, <laughs> because we want to. There are yeah. others that in the world of, of any, any popular music, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of bands and acts recording new stuff, doing covers, etc. And from time to time, accidentally, it's possible a set of notes or a riff can sound awfully similar. Share with us, if you would, uh, we've already talked again a little bit about George Harrison, uh, My Sweet Lord, and He's So Fine by the Chiffons, but share with us a sample of a case uh, or an incident where a rock band knowingly ripped somebody else off with no intention of either crediting uh, or paying royalties for it. And then share one, if you could, a case maybe we might not know about where something sort of happened accidentally and it was obvious that no genuine intent or harm was uh, meant to be. Well, I think in the, in the uh, first category, along with Zeppelin, um, where they were obviously aware of wh where these songs had come from, and there are a couple other cases like that, mostly old blues songs that they take and, and then just kind of reconnoitered a little bit, but didn't really credit the original uh, authors. A uh, case that springs to mind, it springs to mind though, of people who kind of probably knew what they were doing was um, uh, the case of Ghostbusters by Ray Parker Jr. Um, uh, according to Huey Lewis, the producers of the movie Ghostbusters came to him, I believe it was in 1983, when their song, I Want a New Drug, was out and said they wanted to use that song in the movie. And uh, he said, thanks a lot, but we don't want to. And uh, if, then subsequently, about six months later, Huey Lewis is driving along and he heard uh, Ray Parker Jr.'s song, Ghostbusters. Yeah. Ghostbusters, the number one hit kids in 1984 there's no accounting for taste i don't know what was in the water back in the 80s right. but anyway uh it was the number one hit and he was just freaked out and according to later trial testimony what had happened was after being turned down by huey lewis they went to ray parker and said um 
like something kind of poppy and bouncy for the theme song to the movie. Something, uh, well, something like this. And actually played him on one of the new drugs by Huey Lewis. And if you listen to the two songs, they're quite, uh, quite similar yeah. in many ways. And uh, that was an out-of-court uh, settlement. I guess uh, I never so thought I think, about those two together until you just mentioned it, but you're right. If you play them side by side, yeah. they'll sound a lot alike. Yeah, Huey was very unhappy because he said they wanted to buy the song, and in a way they ended up doing it. They, he said no, but in a way they ended up buying it. The case of something that was sort of, uh, which I think was just accidental or coincidental, uh, the Rolling Stones were ready to put out their um, uh, at the Bridges to Babylon album in 1997, and they... Um, uh, had a song called Anybody Seen My Baby. And, you know, when the Stones put out an album, it's a big production. They were, tour, they were going to tour with it at that time. So there's a lot riding on this, and it's not just the album. It's a whole tour thing that's going to go on. So getting ready, to, they're playing the album, and uh, Keith Richards' daughters, probably in their teens at the time, uh, they're playing Anybody Seen My Baby. They started singing along the Katie Lang song, Constant Craving, to this song. <laughs> hey, Dad, that song sounds just like Katie Lang's Constant Craving. And, uh, Mick and Keith apparently claimed that they, at least Mick Jagger went on the record saying he, he knew Katie Lang, but he wasn't aware of that song. If you remember in the 90s, so that song was pretty popular and played quite a lot. So what they had to do, they didn't want to withdraw the album. The album was all ready to go. and They just called up Katie Lang and her co-writer and gave her a co-writing credit on the song. And uh, so that's like how Katie Lang happened to co-write a Rolling Stones song. So uh, that was a case where it was just probably accidental. Um, but, you know, maybe nobody in the, took their family, nobody in the studio. Uh, it's like the emperor has no clothes. I don't think anybody <laughs> wants to be the one to say to Mick and Keith, hey, you know, that song sounds like, uh, <laughs> sounds just like Katie's song. <laughs> What about uh, anything uh, current that we could follow either online or in the news somewhere? Is there a case uh, that's pending that's drawn your attention? Well, um, you know, we just had the Grammys, I guess it was two weeks ago today, and the song that was selected for Record of the Year, Up Down Funk, by Mark Ronson with Bruno Mars, they already had to cut in the writers of uh, the old Gap Band song, Oops Upside Your Head. And uh, if anybody wants to compare those two songs back to back, you'll hear why. They just lifted the title phrase from the old uh, Gap Band song. And so there are five writers, I believe it's up to like 14 now, maybe it's 11 or 14 co-authors of Uptown Funk now, because they had to cut in the five writers from the Gap Band, including the singer Charlie Wilson. Um, the year, uh, last year, the song of the year, and record of the year and song of the year, the uh, song of the year goes to the writers, was awarded to none other than Sam Smith and his co-writers. Uh, and they, a few months before, they had achieved an out-of-court settlement with Tom Petty and his co-writer, Jeff Lynn, for ELO, um, for, as we mentioned earlier, um, taking the melody from Tom's uh, song, uh, uh, I Won't Back Down. By the way, the same thing in 2009 happened with Vito La Vida, where that's got record as a song of the year, and uh, they had a lawsuit going on at that time, which subsequently <laughs> settled out of court with the guitarist Joe Satriani, because he claimed they had lifted the melody for Vito La Vida from his song, uh, If I Could Fly, uh, from 2004. Currently, um, there is a case going on. I just uh, tweeted something about it yesterday. They're um, just right along the same theme, where Zeppelin is being sued by the estate of a guy named Randy California, who was a guitarist yep. in Spirit, uh -huh. over their 1967 song, Taurus. And I just saw a thing yesterday where he paid said, I don't know that song, I never heard that song. <laughs> Which, again, <laughs> doesn't get you off the hook, right. because he could have heard it. And, uh, you know, this Zeppelin... Uh, shared a couple of bills with Spirit. There's every reason to believe that Jimmy Page was aware of that song, but um, memories are probably fuzzy at this point. <laughs> yeah. You know, as we kind of <laughs> start to... We could talk about this forever. Uh, unfortunately, we're starting to run out of time here. I did, I did want to touch something. And again, uh, we know that there's spin from not only the accuser, but the accusee uh, on what the real situation was. But I'm just curious from all the research that you've done, uh, for the most part, those that have been accused of ripping off, uh, they've got egos. Uh, do you think that they are genuinely, are they trying to rip people off, do you think? Or, or is it, in fact, in some ways a coincidence and it's just too bad that they didn't write it first? 
they're, they're, it, it, you know, it's very hard to assign intent to people without getting inside their head. The judge in the George Harrison Meisley Board said uh, that it was subconscious plagiarism. Okay, maybe it was, but how does he know that? How does he know that George Harrison didn't say, you know what, uh, maybe right. nobody will notice. You know, John Lennon said, of, co- of course he, George should have known. He knows, this is the same song, of course he should have known. He should have changed it around. You know, uh, of course, John got in trouble uh, himself over the song uh, "Come Together." Yeah, uh, he got sued by Chuck Berry's publishers over that one. Um, but you know what I found in in which I didn't expect to find, but in in writing the book, many times the person accused the person that did the ripping off kind of got a career out of it, got their foot in the door of their career. That was certainly the case with the Beach Boys uh, Surfing USA. They had Surfing Safari a little bit before that, but Surfing USA was the one that really put them on the map. And that was just a rewrite of Chuck Berry's, uh, really the same song with different lyrics and some harmonic things. So Chuck Berry's Sweet Little Sixteen, Chuck Berry for a long time actually, as a result of legal action, on the publishing to Surfing USA. Now if you see it, it's split between he and Brian Wilson. Uh, look at Sam Smith. I mean, he took the song, maybe, well, I don't know if it was consciously or not, maybe it wasn't. Sam Smith was actually born after Tom Petty's song came out, which will make you feel old. But, um, you know, he's got a great career going for him now. He was just on the Oscars last night singing yep. the Bond song. Yep. So uh, one of the weaker Bond songs, in my opinion. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, you know, you had, okay, you got to pay off. You got to pay a portion of the royalties. But, hey, why not? You've got a career going now. You got a career in there. Yeah, a few cases. You bet you do. You know what's interesting too? What I get a big kick out of is there are hundreds of thousands of tracks on albums, CDs, etc. Over in the in the entire history of rock genre, let's just say since say the mid fifties, and hundreds of thousands that may very well sound like other songs. No one cares because they weren't hits and they're unknowns. The songs we're talking about, for the most part are the ones that made the big time let everybody notice, and there was also new, there was a bankroll there to go after. That's right, but I one kind of one of the cool things I found in the book, like I've always been fascinated by the Beatles, I'm extensive extensive uh, chapter on them. Two of their songs, though, were sort of directly inspired by sort of obscure American R and B guys. Uh, yeah. The riff from "I Feel Fine" was taken derived from a song by a guy named Bobby Park, an American bluesman, that had really a low charting hit from 1961. But showing what a music fan he was, John Lennon picked up on it. Um, and really wrote the riff to I Feel Fine around that. Uh, if you listen to the song uh, Revolution, the intro of that, the very memorable intro to the uh, Hey Jude B-Side version, uh, was directly lifted from a very obscure song from the 50s called Do Unto Others by American blues guy named Pee Wee Creighton. And it's just astounding how it's exactly the same. They just lifted it. Exactly, the introduction, <laughs> very memorable introduction. And uh, just shows what music fans they were. Uh, that they would know these obscure guys. And as I say, the great thing is all this stuff is on YouTube now. People can check it out and hear it for themselves. That's great. Again, the work is Sounds Like Teen Spirit, Stolen Melodies, Ripped Off Riffs, and the Secret History of Rock and Roll with our good buddy Tim English. It is published. Uh, who published this thing? Time English Time English Books published that. Tim English Books. That'd be you. That'd be you. Hey, Tim, how can people find out more about not only about the book but also some of the music work you do? Well, uh, I do most of my social media on uh, Twitter, which is at Tim English Books. Uh, if people want to hear some samples from the book, you can go to soundsliketeenspirit.com. That also has a link uh, to where you can buy it on Amazon. Well, we appreciate it. Best of luck. And uh, next time you got something new coming out, we'd love to have you back on again. Hey, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much, Walter. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.